Hello, and welcome to the webinar, BRFSS Data for Cognitive Decline and Caregiving. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the GSA website. A notice to all attendees will be distributed once the recording is available. A question and answer session will immediately follow the live presentations. Throughout the program, we will be accepting questions through the questions feature accessible on the GoToWebinar panel. Speakers for today's program are Dr. Lisa McGuire and Dr. Christopher Taylor at the CDC Alzheimer's Disease and Healthy Aging Program. So without further delay, I'll hand the microphone to Dr. Lisa McGuire. Well, this afternoon, uh, Dr. Taylor and I are going to talk about a little bit about the behavioral risk factor surveillance system. Next slide, Chris, please. Um, we're also going to talk a brief overview of the cognitive decline module and also the caregiving module. Um, there will be in-depth webinars the next two Fridays describing how to analyze and interpret that data. And then the fourth thing that we're going to talk about today is some of the other valuable data resources that are available related to cognitive decline and caregiving. Next slide, please. So to start out today, I just want to ground us in thinking about what the scope of Alzheimer's disease is in the United States. So I'm going to focus first a little bit on the cognition and the BRFSS. We know in the U.S. about almost 6 million older adults have Alzheimer's disease or a related type of dementia. We expect that to increase to almost 14 million by 2050. We know that Alzheimer's disease is associated with increasing age, and we can see that demonstrated here in the statistics. And then approximately two thirds of the people who have Alzheimer's disease or related dementia are women. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk a little bit about first what the BRFSS is. So the BRFSS is CDC's Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. It was started in 1984 and established as the nation's premier system of health-related telephone surveys. And it collects data from each of the 50 states, DC, and several territories annually. Data is collected on adults that are 18 years old and older, and these are non-institutionalized adults who are typically residing in the community. And it collects information on a variety of health conditions, health risk factors, healthcare access and utilization, chronic health conditions and injuries, as well as preventable infectious diseases. The data are archived uh, from 1984 to the present and are available on CDC's website. Um, each year, more than 400,000 interviews are completed annually. And for, for most states and county level uh, data sources, this is one of the best data sources available for state and county level health data. Next slide, please. So the BRFSS is structured with four components. First, there's the core survey. And the course survey is implemented with standardized protocols. It includes regular as well as rotating course, and it must be used in all the states or territories that participate in the collection of the BRFS data. So in other words, the course survey is uniform across all sites that are administering the, the survey. Second are the optional survey modules. And these are a set of questions that are, that are topic specific, focusing on one topic. These can be proposed by uh, CDC programs and other agencies. And we're gonna focus today on two of those optional modules. The third component are state added questions. So each state um, can add and does add questions that meets the individual needs, priorities, issues that are occurring in their state. Then the fourth component are special project additions, and these are proposed on an as-need basis with dedicated funding, such as an asthma callback survey. So if somebody on the, the BRFS survey says that they have asthma, then, then they may ask them, 
would it be okay for us to call you back in the future and ask additional questions? And if they say yes, then they would receive another survey uh, phone call. Next slide, please. Here are a list of the variety of different topics that are included in that core survey. So remember this core survey is administered uniformly across all sites that administer the BRFSS. So we can see here on the left, the, the uh, demographic variables that are included. We can see a variety of other variables that are included as well in the blue and the purple bars. Next slide, please. Now the BRFS has their core questions or the core topics do rotate. And so there are certain questions that will appear only on even numbered year surveys. So for example, in 2020, then there are other topics that will include on the odd numbered year, such as in 2021. Uh, and you can see those listed here as well. Next slide, please. Uh, I mentioned that another component of the BRFS is those optional modules. So here is a list of the optional modules that have been approved by the BRFS staff and coordinators. The two that we are focusing on in our webinar series are the caregiving module and also the cognitive decline module. Next slide, please. And I will turn it over to Dr. Taylor. Thank you. So first, uh, we're going to discuss our cognitive, cognitive decline optional module. So to give you a little bit of background on that, um, as the Alzheimer's disease program here at CDC, um, one of our important questions um, that you know is of public health importance is, how do we know how many people have Alzheimer's disease? It's hard to measure the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, um, you can't call someone up on a phone and say, do you have Alzheimer's disease? Do you have a problem with your memory? Um, it's not an appropriate question to ask. It wouldn't be a valid question to ask. Um, so the current estimates that are available are actually extrapolations from community-based longitudinal studies that are then applied to a nationally representative sample. And as part of this study, um, the everyone who participates in it gets a diagnostic evaluation, which we know is not necessarily true for many older adults. We know um, many older adults who have symptoms of Alzheimer's disease or other related dementias who never seek a diagnosis um, or assistance with their symptoms. Um, but beca because we don't yet know what the underlying organic cause of Alzheimer's disease or related dementias are, we. Um, these future projections on the number of people who have Alzheimer's disease are based solely on demographic changes. So as the proportion of older adults in the nation becomes larger because of extended lifespan, uh, the number of people that we believe have Alzheimer's disease also increases. So from a health, public health point of view, um, we have an alternative that we can look at um, in surveys like BRFSS is what we call subjective cognitive decline, or SCD. So SCD, we define as the self-reported experience of confusion or memory loss that is either happening more often or is getting worse as reported during the previous 12 months. That would be the previous 12 months prior to the administration of the survey. And as Dr. McGuire mentioned, we'll be going over this module as well as uh, the cognitive decline module in more depth in the next two sessions within this webinar series. So the SCD module. So we know not everyone with subjective cognitive decline or SCD goes on to develop Alzheimer's disease or related dementia, but we do know many do. And so subjective cognitive decline is an indicator of potential future burden and needs, which is very useful in public health um, we can look at potential future burden for healthcare systems, uh, for long-term services and supports, including um, caregivers, and potential needs in communities that provide some of these services. And one of the reasons um, why cognitive decline is so important is because it could potentially lead to early diagnosis. And if um, you're not someone who's regularly involved with um, the science in the Alzheimer's disease field, there are a lot of reasons why someone 
um, would find it beneficial to seek early diagnosis uh, for Alzheimer's disease or related dementia. The first of which is that the symptoms might be treatable. Um, they might be reversible because they might not be dementia. Um, symptoms that relate to um, delirium or things like profound urinary tract infections, medication um, interactions, nutritional deficiencies can all have symptoms that mimic some symptoms of Alzheimer's disease or related dementias. So seeking treatment for that could help alleviate those symptoms um, if there is a cure or treatment for that underlying concern. Um, additionally, treatment of Alzheimer's disease is most effective early in the disease process. Most of the approved drugs that we have that can treat symptoms of Alzheimer's disease uh, work most effectively in those earliest stages. Um, and also diagnoses are more accurate early in that disease process. Medical history reported by patients is more accurate, um, you know, because as time goes on and people in their um, Alzheimer's disease or related dementia becomes more severe, uh, their memory worsens. And so recall for things like medical history becomes much more difficult. You, um, an early diagnosis can help assess injury risk, which then can go on to prevent um, future hospitalizations um, related to things like falls or um, events related to medication mismanagement, as an example. Um, it's empowering. Patients can participate in their own medical decisions, legal decisions, financial decisions, including those related to long-term care. Um, an early diagnosis can allow someone to talk about what they want their final years to be. Um, do they want to live with family? Would they like to age in place at their home for as long as possible? Um, what kind of estate planning could be done now to help support them in the coming years? All is very important. Um, also, to go along with that, the ability to use resources to support um, those, what could be done in those early stages on, and on what to expect. So someone um, can learn about what to expect as their um, disease progresses. Um, they are more eligible to participate in research studies, including clinical trials, where early stage patients are often lacking in participation because many people don't um, show up for diagnoses until later. It's very hard to um, develop medications that can assist someone early on if you don't have enough patients in those early stages where they can participate in those clinical trials to determine a medication's efficacy. Um, also allows um, to someone to garden or caregiver support expectations early on, talk about um, where a person might wanna live, um, potential care for them later on, um, long-term care, um, and long-term care that can be um, delayed because is, if you are empowered to make these decisions early on, it becomes more beneficial um, to the decisions that have to be made in the coming years. So there's a lot of benefits uh, to early diagnosis. So going through the module itself. Um, so our module, um, we can assess the prevalence of subjective cognitive decline and areas where subjective cognitive decline may have impacted someone's daily routine or their activities. As Dr. McGuire mentioned, these questions are part of an optional module. It's administered only in adults 45 years of age and older. Those are the adults most likely to report subjective cognitive decline. So we don't ask it in younger um, respondents um, because it, it doesn't have that much utility in people under the age of 45. It's a six question module. And the very first question is a screener for SCD. We don't ask anyone directly, do you have subjective cognitive decline? Um, we'll get to the questions in a minute. But if, if um, when we ask them about symptoms of SCD, if they say no, we don't ask the remaining five questions. We move on to the next module in BRFSS. And as I mentioned, this is an optional module, but it has been administered. We've been very successful. It's been administered in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico, um, if you combine the years 2015 through 2018. And our goal is to have all 50 states administer this module again uh, across the years of 2019 and 2020. So just a map here, um, the BRFSS um, administration of this module for 2015 through 2019. Um, you can see what color your state is. The purple is the most recent year of data that we're presenting here from 2019, which included 
31 states plus the District of Columbia. So I'll go now through the questions within the module. So as I mentioned, the first question is about STD stats. Um, so as part of BRFSS, there is an interviewer over the, because it's a telephone health survey, um, the, in view, the interviewer instructions lets the respondent know that the following questions as part of this module, we aren't asking about occasional memory lapses, which happen to everyone, but rather these questions are asking about memory loss that's related to forgetting how to do familiar activities or things that the respondent would usually know. So not forgetting your keys, not occasionally forgetting about an appointment, things more severe that could potentially impact um, your daily activities. So the first question is, during the past 12 months, have you experienced confusion or memory loss that is happening more often or is getting worse? And that's a yes, no question. And I'm just gonna go over these questions and we hope you'll join us next week for our um, next part of this webinar series where we'll go into these questions more in depth. So if someone does, have, um, does say yes, that these symptoms uh, I have experience, we go on to the other questions in the module. This is the second question is about day-to-day -day activities. So during the past year, as a result of this confusion or memory loss, how often have you given up day-to-day -day household activities you used to do, such as cooking, cleaning, taking medications, paying bills, driving your car? The third question is, as a result of these symptoms, how often do you need assistance with these day-to-day -day activities, such as cleaning, driving, paying your bills? And for those that say they frequently need assistance, we then go on as a follow-up question and say, when you need help with these day-to-day -day activities, how often are you able to get the help that you need? Which is very important. It's one thing to need help. It's another thing to have access to that help. Our next question is about um, impaired ability to work. So during the past 12 months, how often has confusion or memory loss interfered with your ability to not only work, but volunteer or otherwise engage in social activities outside of your home? So this isn't just about the ability focusing on your job or career because this is such a wide span of people starting at age 45 all the way up through the upper end of um, age for BRFSS. So working, volunteering, or engaging in other social activities outside the home, we wanna find out if you're impaired to do that. And then additionally, our sixth question is, have you or anyone else discussed your confusion or memory loss with a healthcare professional? So if you do have these symptoms, have you told anyone or has anyone um, talked to a healthcare professional on your behalf about these symptoms? And so just as an overview of are ADRD, Alzheimer's disease and related dementia and cognition activities. There's a list here. In the lower right-hand corner is the link to our website, cdc.gov aging. All of our resources are there available for free. Um, just through some of the um, items listed here, we do have a newly awarded Bold Public Health Centers of Excellence. Um, and you can find more information on all of these things on our website in addition to our bold public health programs and our newly awarded National Healthy Brain Initiative. Um, those are sort of our keystone programs for our program here at CDC in the Alzheimer's Disease and Healthy Aging Program, and you can find all of the information about that on the website. Um, we do have some um, items that are could be a resource for you looking at our surveillance of cognitive decline using BRFSS. So we have a page on how to analyze and interpret the data. We offer infographics free of charge um, for states um, nationally. So if your state participated in BRFSS, we have an infographic from the year that you participated looking at caregiving. Um, we also have for some specific groups focused on either groups by race or ethnicity, gender, LGBT status uh, for veterans, as well as people who live in rural areas. And many of these infographics are available in English, but also Spanish. And our Spanish translation activities are ongoing. We have data for action briefs that can tell you more information about how some of these data have been used in public health practice. We have a customizable data portal that will be discussed in next week's webinar, as well as a list of our scientific publications. If you'd like to find out more about how we analyze some data 
or how some of the, these data have been used in publications. You can check those out as well. We also have our roadmap, another keystone activity for our program, um, and as well as some publications focusing on risk reduction and early detection. Our Healthy Brain Initiative Roadmap for Indian Country. We also have podcasts and videos available in both English and Spanish. Uh, web content about basics of Alzheimer's disease and dementia, also available in English and Spanish. We have trainings on brain health for pro professionals and students, including links to a curriculum uh, for students in public health, as well as uh, very timely COVID-19 information and guidance for older adults. We encourage you to check out all of those resources, again, available free of charge on our website at cdc.gov aging. And I will turn it back to Dr. McGuire to discuss our caregiving module. Great, thank you for that very informative presentation, Dr. Taylor. So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about caregiving. And so we know that um, an estimated about 21% of adults and this is adults 18 and older serve as a caregiver to someone whether and it's an unpaid caregiver so it's a family member or friend we know that caregiving has many benefits um, including enhancing the bond between the caregiver and the care recipient um, and, and it can be a very valuable and awarding experience for both individuals involved we know that at the same time, caregiving can be stressful and it can place an emotional and even physical strain on the caregiver who may not be in the best physical shape themselves to be providing care or assistance. Uh, we know that some, some data suggesting that uh, providing care can lead to higher rates of depression, lower quality of life, as well as poorer health. Um, we do know that there is a, a large share of the U.S. population is expected to grow and eventually um, the need for caregivers will also grow as well too. Next slide please. So I'm going to talk about our caregiving module. So our caregiving module as well is an optional module and it is, it is a little bit larger than our cognitive decline module. It is nine questions long. So just as an overview here, um, we ask, uh, uh, I'll give you a little bit more about the actual caregiver question, but we also ask about the relationship between the caregiver and the care recipient, the duration, the intensity, what the health condition is, um, and the types of activities that the caregiver um, is providing. In addition, if someone is not currently serving as a caregiver, we ask that ask if they expect or anticipate being a caregiver in the next two years. Next slide, please. And this slide is illustrating for us the states and territories that had administered the, the caregiver module from 2015 to 2019. Next slide, please. So this first question um, is really a, getting at if somebody is a caregiver. And the key is we do not ask people directly if they are a caregiver, just like we don't ask them directly if they have subjective cognitive decline. One thing that we do know from the caregiving literature is that many people who are a caregiver don't necessarily identify as a caregiver or classify the love, support, care, or assistance they're providing as caregiving. They may interpret what they're doing as picking up groceries for a neighbor while they tend to be getting their own groceries. Um, or it might be helping you know, their parent with yard work. Um, so the question that we are asking people is we ask them, uh, we say that people may provide regular care or assistance to a family member or friend who has a health problem or a disability. So we say during the past 30 days, did you provide regular care assistance to a family member or friend who has a health problem or a disability? So the key here is it's regular care or assistance to a friend or a family member that does have some type of a health problem. Next slide, please. The second question is we ask what that relationship is. Um, so in other words, is it the person you're providing care to, is that your mom? Is that your dad? Is that a neighbor? 
uh, uh, there's a whole list of relationships that somebody could be providing care of that is measured on the BRFSS. Next slide, please. So the next two questions are asking about that intensity and the duration. So we asked people how long they provided care for that person. And on the average week, um, how many hours do you provide care or assistance? Next slide. Then on the question five, we ask about what is the main health problem? So what is the main health problem, long-term illness, disability that that person has that you care for? Um, we have uh, 14 different categories that include a variety of chronic conditions, mental illness, substance abuse, or addiction. Plus, there is also another, an other option um, that people can select from. Next slide, please. So question six is new for the 2019 module. So what we found in our analysis of the data is many times uh, people who were completing the BRFS survey might have said old age, they might have said frailty, or they may have said other is the main is the reason they're providing care or assistance. So what we have done with the addition of question number six is we have asked, does the person you you care for also have Alzheimer's disease, dementia, or another cognitive impairment. And this is only asked of those participants who did not indicate Alzheimer's, dementia, or cognitive impairment in the previous health condition question. Uh, we added this question to really try to get a better estimate of, uh, of the number of caregivers who are providing care or assistance uh, to family members or friends who do have Alzheimer's disease or another related type of dementia. Next slide, please. So questions in seven and eight are really looking at the types of care or assistance that's being provided. So question seven, in the past 30 days, did you provide care for a person by managing personal care, such as giving medications, feeding, dressing, or bathing? Then question eight is asking a very similar question, but they're wanting to know about that care if you're taking care of household tasks. So question seven and eight are really getting at if you're providing personal care assistance and as well as household activities or tasks. Next slide, please. Question nine, question nine is only ask of people who've indicated that they're not currently a caregiver. And so we ask, um, in the next two years, do you expect to provide care or assistance to a friend or family member? Next slide, please. So I want to highlight for you um, a publication that we had about a year ago now, looking at characteristics of health status of our caregiver caregiving module. Um, so this used data from the BRFS our, our caregiving module. And what we found with that is about 21% of people aged 18 and older reported that they were a caregiver. 60% of them were women. Um, but one thing that's important to note is we noticed that almost 20% of caregivers indicated that their health was either in fair or poor condition. Um, and there was a lot of variation uh, between each of the states as well. So one thing that I want to point out here is even though we're focusing today on the optional caregiving module and the optional cognitive decline module, you're able, if you're doing analysis, to link those variables to information that is in the core of the BRFS survey. So for example, this health condition or health status is a core question from the BRFS survey, and we are able to look at those core questions and how they relate to people who are caregivers or non-caregivers. So I wanna give a shout out to my colleagues in our webinar number two and webinar number three, who will be providing more examples of that. Next slide, please. And here's an overview of our caregiving activities. The ones that I'm going to focus on today really are the surveillance components. So those under that bold um, second bullet that you see listed there. 
Many of these Dr. Taylor already pointed out, but we have documents on available on our website on how to analyze and interpret the data from both of these modules. We have infographics that are available, um, and they are both in English and Spanish. Um, you can also look at one of them. We have a data for action caregiving brief that you will hear more about in one of the next webinars, as well as our customized data portal. Um, I think Dr. Taylor highlighted most of the content here. I encourage you to check out the materials that we do have on our website. Next slide, please. And now I will turn it back to Dr. Taylor to talk about some additional data. Thank you. Um, so one of our other sources of data for cognitive decline is the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or NHANES. Uh, so previously, um, there had been some cognitive components to this administered during the 2011 to 2012 and the 2013 to 2014 NHANES data collection cycles. Um, so a little bit of background of, with NHANES. It's also conducted by CDC. There are several components. There's a phone component. Um, or really a questionnaire component, but then there's also an in-person examination in what's called the MEC, or the Mobile Exam Center. So as part of the interview questions, we asked the question that was similar to what we, actually the same as what we have in BRFSS. During the past 12 months, have you experienced confusion or memory loss that is happening more often or is getting worse? There was an additional question during the past seven days, have, how often have you had trouble remembering where you put things like your keys or your wallet? So in addition to those interview questions, um, when a survey um, participant came to the mobile exam center, they were also administered three tests of cognitive performance. So one is a word recall where they're asked to, where they're provided a list of words that they then repeat back to the interviewer, both immediately as well as um, it's a delayed recall. So maybe about uh, 10 minutes later. A category, categorical verbal fluency or animal naming, they're asked to name as many animals as they can within a certain time period, as well as the digit symbol substitution test. Um, and so there were about 2,500 persons, 60 years of age and older who completed these modules over this four year data period within Ann Haynes. And so what we found from that um, using this data over this four-year period, um, that subjective cognitive decline, um, there, well, I guess let me start. So the data on the performance test, we were able to link what we call subjective cognitive decline, or what someone thinks their memory status is, with these objective measures of cognitive performance. So things that are scored, um, you know, independent of the person's opinion. And so the STD, and then we also examined their age, income, education level, their self-reported health. Um, and we found that those were independently associated with lower cognitive performance, specifically low income and low education. And those without subjective cognitive decline were highly unlikely to score poorly on objective measures of cognitive performance, meaning that the STD question has a high level of specificity. And if you're interested in this further, um, the footnote for this paper that both Dr. McGuire and I were co-authors on is linked at the bottom of the page, and that's also through CDC's website with the National Center for Health Statistics. So additionally, uh, we began to collect cognitive data as part of NHANES for both 2019-2020 as well as 2021 and 2022. That included the same interview question about the 12 month period and in, in more frequent confusion or memory loss, as well as cognitive performance testing, which we switched for this data cycle in the mobile exam center instead of the word, the categorical um, fluency and recall and the digit symbol substitution test, we exchanged it for the Montreal Cognitive Assessment or MOCA, um, which is a very a common and well-used assessment of, of cognition. However, as you know, in the world we are living in at the moment, um, not the um, those um, in-person assessments are not going on at the moment. 
Um, NHANES is not in the field. And so the data, the data collection for these data cycles is currently interrupted. And so when things get more back to normal um, with return, with the ability of older adults to come to the mobile exam center, um, these will be revisited. And I will pass it back to Dr. McGuire for our summary. Great, thank you very much. And I do want to say that the the NHANES data for the first cycle that Dr. Taylor mentioned is publicly available, um, and we encourage your use and analysis of it. Okay, so I wanted to close today by really just pointing out that the BRFS collects a, a lot of very valuable data from community dwelling adults on a variety of topics. And the, one of the main points that I want us to be able to see today is that you can use our caregiving module or our cognitive decline module, and you can link that information to do analysis on a state basis if you'd like. You could look at all of the states that are available and link that information to um, the core questions on the BRFSS. The cognitive decline in the caregiving modules, as we know, are both included on the BRFS, and we, we our intent with this webinar share, series is to show you how to analyze the data in these, value, in these modules, as well as utilize that data and also some other really valuable resources for action and impact. Next slide, please. So we uh, keep hinting to the rest of the webinars in our webinar series. Um, we hope that you will register, so please note that you need to register for each of the webinars. Um, and we have wonderful speakers and presenters that are going to share with you some of the information of how they analyze the data, how they've used it, as well as some of the tools and resources that we have available for you at CDC. Next slide. Um, if you do not already or receive our newsletter, please sign up. Uh, we send uh, newsletters once a month, maybe twice a month, and we'll share with you some of the latest materials that we have as they become available. Next slide. On behalf of Dr. Taylor and myself, I want to thank you for joining us today, and we will um, start to entertain questions. And I believe we have a couple of those already, Dr. Taylor. Um, so the first one is, are there any rural urban indicators on the BRFSS? So if you would like, if you have a specific question about how to make that, do analysis that are urban, rural, or, or uh, rural or not, um, please send Dr. Taylor an email and we can send you the resources that are available of how to make those classifications uh, within the BRFS data set. Because uh, we do have an infographic for rural adults as well. So Dr. Taylor, um, one of the questions is about what languages the BRFS is administered in. Um, so what are some of the, so is the BRFS only administered in English or are there some other languages that it is available in? Um, it's administered in English. I, there's also um, the ability to administer it in Spanish. I believe they've had Spanish translation since the late 80s. Um, I believe those are the only two languages. Um, in contrast, um, if anyone is, is interested in the NHANES data, um, NHANES is um, translated not only in English and Spanish, but also um, several Southeast Asian languages. Um, and I, I don't remember them all, but um, NHANES um, uh, lists them on their website. Um, and so the their BRFSS, um, and NHANES do administer in different languages, um, and that data is reflected in the data sets. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Taylor. And uh, if you have some que have further questions about where to find that information, uh, please email Dr. Taylor, and he can point you to the the right resource on either the NHANES website or the CDC's BRFS website. So one of the other questions that I'll handle is ask one of the one of our attendees today wants to know, are there plans to include indicators of living arrangement between caregiver and care recipient? 
caregivers may live far away from the care recipient, um, especially in rural areas or just live across country, um, it might be an interesting question to add if possible. Additionally, future questions for considering might include coordinating care or care, coordinating care for the care recipient. This is a wonderful, wonderful ideas, wonderful suggestions. One thing that we are doing uh, about every five years is we are looking at the questions that we have on the BRFSS in our optional module. So both the cognitive decline and the caregiving module. And so we are right now assembling panels of experts to really make sure that our questions are capturing the information that is the most useful um, to, to you all and make sure that those questions are um, getting at the most important issues, which some of those issues do change and evolve over time. So we will definitely make note of that about the living arrangement. One thing that you can look at with the BRFSS is you can look at if the person who completed the caregiver, the, the survey who's the caregiver, you can find out if they live alone. And so that would at least give you some indication that they're not living with the care recipient. Um, and you also can find out if there are children in the household as well. But some of those other points you raise are really, really important, especially the coordination of care. And also we recognize that many people don't necessarily have just one caregiver. Um, and we're not capturing that at the moment either. Um, okay, so the next question, um, I think I'll ask this to Dr. Taylor. What do you anticipate the impact of this program will be on better supporting BIPOC, so Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. With Thank you, with neurodegenerative illnesses. Thank you. Um, so as a public health program, uh, especially as a national public health program, uh, we're committed to, uh, one of our primary goals is collecting data. And so collecting valuable data um, means not only collecting information about the condition itself, if we're talking about medical conditions, but also about social determinants of health, and socio-demographics that we know are related to health, um, both medical health and public health. Um, so in addition to collecting these data, we've developed some, um, we have infographics related to race and ethnicity. Um, more specifically for indigenous persons, uh, we have our roadmap for Indian country and all of our um, awards, um, including the two bold awards and as well as the National Healthy Brain Initiative, all have a focus on, include a focus on social determinants of health. And that's a big push with CDC. Um, and so we are trying to make sure that, so for our purposes with data collection, we wanna make sure that the data we're collecting is reflective of the populations that live in the nation. And then we wanna make sure that that data um, is useful in a public health way. So if we can look at specific groups, either by race or ethnicity um, and determine um, if a certain population is more at risk than another, then we release that data, we try to translate that data, and we try to work with our partners to turn that into public health programs. Okay, thank you very much. So one of our other questions is, do you know why states select the optional modules for cognitive decline or caregiving, or how they use that data for, for program planning? So the BRFSS is a state-based surveillance system where the states make the decisions of which optional modules that they choose to include on a given year. Um, states select those optional modules based on priorities within the state um, and also based on the, the space that is available on the survey. Um, so there's a there's a variety of different factors that go into that as well too because there's from a methodological standpoint they don't want the survey to be too long because they want people to complete the entire survey so if it's too long there's fear that people would would either hang up or they would just uh, uh, terminate their participation in the survey so there's a lot of thought and care that goes into that as well into the length of the survey as well as the content of the survey. Um, the last webinar in our series, um, the one on March 5th, will focus on 
how states can and do use data for planning as well as for us establishing and setting priorities within their, their state or jurisdiction. Okay, Chris, I'll send this one to you. Does the BRFS interview older adults living in assisted living, nursing homes, or other residential care facilities? Thank you. That's an easy question. The answer is no. Uh, BRFSS uh, focuses solely on community living adults 18 years of age and older. Um, so anyone who lives um, in a congregate um, setting like an assisted living or nursing home would not be included in BRFSS. So the persons that live in those facilities, um, they are not reflected um, in either the caregiving or the cognitive decline modules, as well as any of the other modules in BRFSS. Okay. All right. Well, I will also turn this one over to you too, Dr. Taylor. Um, how are you evaluating the questions on the SCD module regarding engaging in social activities outside the home in 2020? And we may even add 2021 there as well. That's a very interesting question, and it's not something we have entirely figured out yet. Um, so as you know, part of that question is not only social activities outside the home, but also working or volunteering. Um, and it might be that we provide um, interviewer instructions. So in case a respondent has a question, um, or it might be a possibility where we're talking about um, potentially, um, well, I think the, we won't be changing the question at this point. The question's already in the field. Um, but I think that'll have to be a caveat or a limitation with any statistical analyses we do with that question um, because people won't be doing activities outside their home in the same way for 2020 and 2021. Excellent point. Um, things that we're going to have to be thinking through in the next short period of time. Okay, so our next question is someone who is asking about the curriculum resources that we have available and some challenges watching the videos. Um, I would encourage you, please reach out to me um, with your specific question and issue, and I will get, um, get you an answer or a response or, or get it fixed on our website. Okay, so Dr. Taylor, is there a way to classify those with SCD and those who have a diagnosis of dementia or a ADRD? Uh, not with BRFSS, no. So um, we can obviously, as part of the cognitive decline module, ask about SCD status. We do get that information. Uh, but honestly, our hope is that there would be nobody um, with uh, severe, anyway, dementia or ADRD who provides information to BRFSS, not because we wouldn't find that information useful, um, but because, or because we don't think that population is important, but because um, when you have someone who isn't providing what might be considered reliable data uh, for a number of reasons, um, we, we, from a survey methods point of view, we try not to include unreliable data um, that would be included in analyses. So we only have those data, and actually the BRFSS interviewers are well-trained um, if they do believe someone is providing um, unreliable data, um, then um, they have ways to manage that as part of the interviewing process. Correct, correct. As well as there's also a code um, for the reason that the survey was terminated that we can look at as well. Okay, so I'm gonna, Chris, I think we're both gonna answer this question. So our next questioner says, what would you say some of the most pressing data gaps that exist around these two modules? When I say that, what I mean is, what might be most helpful areas of research to look at in terms of furthering knowledge in these areas and healthy aging research more broadly? So they want to pick our brains and want to know what are some of the most helpful areas that people could be looking at with these data. Um, so I really think because we we at CDC have done um, you know a number of things just recently we've done some analyses looking at cognitive decline and caregiver status we've looked at cognitive decline and physical activity. Um, it, we've, it's been a variety. Um, I would say 
I, I guess I don't want to limit it. Um, I would say really anything, any area of health that's covered in BRFSS, there could be a possibility of looking at that and um, seeing how that could relate to potential cognitive decline as defined as with SCD. Um, for example, we have a lot of things on diet, um, healthy diet. I don't think we've looked at that. Um, medication management potentially, mm. uh, things related to um, blood pressure, um, other um, uh, chronic conditions. Um, we did have a paper published um, last year that looked at um, cognitive decline and chronic conditions because we do know that people with forms of cognitive decline, whether uh, initially we knew that things like mild cognitive impairment and ADRD can impact someone's ability to manage their own um, other chronic conditions like diabetes or heart disease. Um, and so we described adults with SCD as well. So I really think I, I wouldn't want to limit it. And I know that's also part of the work uh, that Dr. McGuire mentioned where um, we are looking to assess what is um, in these modules. And so if there's things within that module that could also be helpful to what's found throughout, um, we, we want to look at that as part of that process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think just building on what Chris says too, so he focused a lot on SCD, so I'll think about caregiving. So, um, you know, like there's questions in there. I mean, maybe one of the nice things I think about our caregiving module is it's not just looking at people who are providing care for persons who have dementia. So you can look at people who are providing care for someone who has cancer or other chronic health conditions. So I think it would be, there, there's a lot of analysis that could be done looking at either the intensity or the duration of care provided by people who are caring for people of different, um, different types of conditions, um, as well as even looking at the types of care that they are providing, whether they're helping more with household tasks or they're providing personal care and assistance. Um, and I mean, there's so many ways that you could pull in then data from the BRFS core, and then look at, you know, things related to that caregiver's health status and the types of things that they are doing as a caregiver as well. Um, okay, for our next question is, is there a way to get national estimates based off these optional modules that not all older adults across the country take. So Chris, I'll, I'll toss that one to you. I think what the person is asking is, can we get, so if we have 400,000 people completing this survey on average, can we get a national estimate from 400,000 people? Uh, sort of, so yes, so the, the, <laughs> this, is a, this is a weighted survey. So um, meaning we have in, in basic terms, we ask around, we complete around 400,000 interviews for BRFSS, I, not me, um, but the BRFSS program um, across all of the participating states and territories. And so those data are sampled in a way. So it's not just we're randomly calling numbers. Um, we, we're trying to get, we are, it, it is random digit dial, but we are trying to get specific people um, with specific demographics to answer questions. And then those data are weighted to reflect the population of the state. So um, we do have, if you look at our infographics on our website, we do have some um, that include all of the states. We do have some that only include uh, some of the states. And so the data actually are representative of all the states participating in the BRFSS for that year. Um, so we, we personally, I never try to say it's nationally representative. It's representative of all the participating states. Mm -hmm. And how that happens, I think the simple way of saying what Dr. Taylor just said is a statistical magic that makes that happen uh, with a lot of hard work behind that. Um, the next question I'll take um, is really a very interesting one that this is really kind of getting at that pandemic. Um, so they're talking about the first question on our caregiver module that ask about providing care or assistance to, you know, someone a health problem or disability, but that seems to leave out just older people who are healthy but have been sheltering at home during the pandemic. 
Um, and they go on to say, for example, my grandmother doesn't have health conditions, but her neighbor has been getting all the groceries for her and doing other tasks like mowing her yard. Does this count during a pandemic? Wow. <laughs> That is really uh, something we're going to have to think through as well, too. But by our definition that we use under normal times, non-pandemic circumstances, it sounds like your grandma's neighbor is providing some care. Um, but we have to think about that because your grandma doesn't, quote, need that care. She could go get her own groceries and she could go... She, I don't know if she should be mowing her lawn, but she could do those kinds of activities prior to the pandemic. And that's really, really a good point that we're going to need to think through um, at CDC on that one. Um, okay, so the next question I'll go to you, Dr. Taylor. Do you recommend that organizations use these questions when interacting to beneficiaries to identify issues at an early stage? Thank you, that's not really something we've looked at. These are questions that are developed for public health survey purposes. Um, I think if someone had a question about a person in their family or someone who they interact with, um, if they had issues related to cognitive decline in some way, um, we would refer them to get an assessment um, with a health professional. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next questioner is asking, um, on our next webinars, are we going to cover how to gain access to the cognitive decline and caregiving modules? The answer is yes, uh, but if you cannot wait until the next week, if you go to cdc.gov slash aging, and under our data and statistics tab, you will see a section for BRFSS, and there are some accordion menus there that show um, explain some of the different questions and issues related to the modules, as well as to, uh, show give you links to get to those. All right, and then our last question that I'm seeing right now that I will I will hand over to Dr. Taylor. Who typically administers these modules? So BRFSS um, functions um, through the BRFSS program at CDC and the participating states. Um, and so we provide support, states um, administer it, um, usually through um, their health department, some sort of, um, there, there's a representative of the state um, who um, contracts with interviewers, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna generalize or speak for the BRFSS program, um, but they have trained interviewers that they contract with um, who know BRFSS and are trained on it, um, trained as part of asking these health-related survey questions. And the states are then responsible um, on their end for administering those survey questions and returning the data to CDC for processing. Correct. And then typically, um, so for example, the the, like we'll use the 2019 data. So the 2019 data was collected through 2019. Then usually in the fall of 2020, that data will be made publicly available. Um, and it is on, uh, if you Google BRFSS, you will find that data. Um, any other questions? These have been some really, really good questions and some very thought-provoking questions for us as well, too. Great. Well, thank you so very much, Dr. McGuire and Dr. Taylor. I'm afraid we've run out of time. Um, and also a big thank you to our attendees today. This is the end of the program. <laughs>